All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, it has been a little bit since we have done a virtual only event. So I'm super excited to do this event this evening. It is going to be really incredible. And there are so many of you here joining us this evening. This is Left Bank Books presents Diane Seuss, one of the most original voices in contemporary poetry. Seuss is the author of five previous poetry collections, including Frank Sonnets, Winner of the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and the Penn Volcker Award. Help us celebrate the launch tonight of modern poetry with a virtual event that you can join from the comfort of your own home. I am so happy we're doing that right now. Tonight, she will be in conversation with longtime friend Jane Hilberry, award-winning poet and professor of creativity and innovation at Colorado College. We are here tonight to celebrate the incredible release of modern poetry. There are signed editions available at Left Bank Books. We do have signed book plates that Diane sent from Michigan that are available while supplies last. So please do get your orders in soon so that we can get those on their way to you wherever you are in the country. It is great to have support from all of you to help us be able to produce these events. We are producing in-person and virtual events and hybrid events as well. So a lot of our events you can join from anywhere in the country, and we are very excited to have you ever join us in person in St. Louis. Uh, we do have some incredible poetry events coming up, including with the amazing Ada Limon uh, coming up in one week. For tonight, I want to talk about the book just a tiny bit. Uh, this is an extraordinary new collection by Diane Seuss. Seuss's signature voice audacious in its honesty, virtuo vir 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 virtuosic in its artistry, outsider in its attitude, has become one of the most original in contemporary poetry. Her latest collection takes its title, Modern Poetry, from the first textbook Seuss encountered as a child and the first poetry course she took in college as an enwrapped but ill-equipped student, one who felt poetry was be beyond her reach. Many of the poems make use of the forms and terms of musical and poetic craft, ballad, fugue, aria, refrain, coda, and contend with the works of writers overrepresented in textbooks and anthologies and those too often underrepresented. Seuss provides a moving account of her picturesque years and their uncertainties, and in the process she enters the realm between modernism and romanticism, beyond between romance and objectivity, with Keats as ghost, lover, and interlocutor. In poems of rangy curiosity, sharp humor, and illuminating self-scrutiny, modern poetry investigates our time's deep isolation and divisiveness and asks, what can poetry be now? Do poems still have the capacity to mean? It seems wrong to curl now within the confines of a poem. Seuss writes, you can't hide from what you made inside what you made. What she finds there, finally, is a surprising but unmistakable love. Tonight, Jane Hillsbury, Hillbury will be joining us as the conversation partner. Jane serves as professor of creativity and innovation at Colorado College, studying how creativity works, doing her own creative work, and fostering creativity in others is the foundation of her professional life sounds amazing. Her poems have appeared in The Sun, The Hudson Review, Virginia Quarterly Review, and many other journals, as well as in anthologies such as Queer Nature and New Poets of the American West. She has published two books of poems, Still the Animals Enter and Body Painting, both with Red Hen Press, both available to order from Left Bank Books. She and her father, Conrad Hilberry, co-authored a chapbook titled This Awkward Art, Poems by a Father and Daughter, with an introduction by Richard Wilbur. For 10 years, she facilitated a program called The Art of the Executive Leader at the Banff Center in Canada. Her honors include the Colorado Book Award for Poetry, the Poetry Prize in Poetry, and Mellon Foundation Grants. She loves collaboration and has had the pleasure of working with many artists, including filmmaker Cynthia Lowen, visual artist Singa Ningudi, and musician Gabrielle Globus-Henschen. 
And tonight we are also joined by the guest of honor, Diane Seuss. Diane is the author of five previous poetry collections, including Frank Sonnets, Winner of the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Critics Circle, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and the Penn Volcker Award. She lives in rural Michigan. Now, without further ado, would you please all help me in welcoming our incredible guests for the evening with a loud round of applause wherever you are. Here are our guests. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There are so many people here. It is incredible. They are all here to help launch this incredible book into the world. And I feel that. I feel their support. And I have all through. So thanks, everybody. Shall I read? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems. And Jane is going to read a few of her poems and maybe something special. Um, and then we'll have a conversation. Um, I want to just briefly thank our host, Shane, the fabulous Shane, um, with his great introductions, and Left Bank Books, thank you so much for hosting this event, and so much appreciation to Jane Hilberry for being here, being with me, and for our long friendship in poetry, and thank you to all the readers and listeners Poems are not complete until they're received. So thank you so much. Shane read a little of this poem, but it's a good place to start, I think. Curl. No longer at home in the world. And I imagine never again at home in the world. Not in cemeteries or bogs churning with bullfrogs or outside the old pickle shop. I once made myself at home on that street and the street after that and the boulevard, the avenue. I don't need to explain it to you. It seems wrong to curl now within the confines of a poem. You can't hide from what you made inside what you made or so I'm told. This is pop song. As Shane said, several of the poems are uh, titled after forms of music, which I don't know much about, but I had to learn. And I've written, as anybody who's read my work knows a lot about my father who died young. And this is a real shift, pop song. I met my father again in a video store by the creamery, in a record store on my lunch break, in a museum whisper booth in Washington Square performing with a Beatles cover band. And he said to me, Di, he said, you're not what I expected. Like an online date who doesn't think you measure up to the photograph. I think he meant I turned out differently than he imagined when I was three and I already learned to read the newspaper. Die, he said. And I saw in his face, well, what father would want me for a daughter? It was as if God looked upon creation and wondered at its atrocities. How, God thinks, could I have fucked up so badly? but keeps it to himself. Die, my father said. We were in the lamb barn of a county fair. The lamb's fleece was matted. They bleated piteously. My father hadn't aged a day. Black hair combed into a wave in the front you could lose yourself in. Children are known to accept their parents' hairstyles without question, no basis yet to judge. I'm not sure he was glad to see me. To a dead man, a living adult daughter must be such an overwhelm, a real load. And from death, he had learned to prefer simplicity, the ephemera of steam rising from a cup birds, but he didn't care what kind of birds. 
He was wearing a humble but clean shirt. He wanted, I believe, to keep it that way. I was like a cake with too many ingredients that had overflowed its pan, spilled into the oven and smoldered there. Die, he said. I could tell he had a mint lozenge in his mouth, one of those that winnows but never really goes away. It wasn't a sheep barn after all where we met up. It was a diner. And he did a spin on a stool at the counter as if to entertain me, as fathers are apt to do, or so I'm told. It's too late for me to be beautiful, I said, the ruin too vast, for I assumed he wanted beauty. Don't fathers want beauty from their daughters? How ashamed he was at my exploits. A nuanced man had lost in death all nuance. In fact, the dead don't love the living. Like Jesus, they judge us. Die was all he said. Nice to see you. Um. This is, uh, there, there are a few longer poems in the book that are kind of um, like the columns that hold up the edifice and, um, and extend what I would call the thesis of the book. And this one is called My Education. It comes early in the book. It's really about my upbringing as a mind, but also... Um, class itself and education itself. My education, not just what I feel, but what I know and how I know it. My unscholarliness, my rawness, all rise out of the cobbled landscape I was born to. Those of you raised similarly, I want to say, this is not a detriment and it is not a benefit. It only is, it is like a cobbled house is, field stones and mortar, slipshod, spare parts wed, welded crookedly, crudely, but cleverly, skinny iron winding staircase leading to the attic, bolted on both ends. And up there, a gap in the window where the snow comes in and architects a little drift on the bed. And meals were cobbled, kernels on the cob haphazardly arranged, not lined up in military rows. And sometimes a row was not filled in at all. And your teeth, when biting down, met an emptiness. And shotgun pellets in the rabbit meat, stray hobnail dishes studded, rescued from an abandoned house on fire and an array of jewel tones would appear without warning on the table. A blood colored butter dish, yellow perch on a cobalt blue platter encircled in fried egg sacs or ducks or a pheasant thrown erratic on the back porch, payment for something given or not taken. When I'd been away and returned, I could see freshly the cobbled lushness of the trees and the arbitrary drift of brown spots on the white cows in the meadows and the wire worm filled tunnels in the morels at the base of dead cherry trees. The cemetery is unsystematic, as is the library. Graves scattered like chicken feed, books strewn on old tables from canceled Sunday school classrooms. I loved books, but learned very little in school. I could read, so the reading instruction drove me nearly mad, and I plugged my ears, first with my hands until I was caught, then with something I could do inside my head that muffled the teacher's voice like she was speaking into a canning jar. 
What I know of literature, of history, is spotty. I was a poor student, disengaged from the things I didn't need, and I knew what I needed and that the time to get it was now. When I needed Keats, I got him. I read enough to get the point, then turned, then tuned into his ghost. I read most of Joseph Conrad, having figured out that I could find some things repulsive and still require them for my project. My project was my life. There was no vision or overarching plan. There was only foraging for supplies, many of which were full of worms or covered in dust like apples on the orchard floor and furniture junked on the side of the road. Have you ever seen a pie cooling on the sill and found yourself hungry enough to steal it? Or does that only happen in picture books? If you're like me, to learn of the gods, you must beg, borrow, and steal. Eavesdrop, as gossip is sagacity, a word I learned from Emily Dickinson. Don't underestimate direct experience. Ants know earth, dragonflies know air. A cobbled mind is not fatal. You have to be willing to self-educate at a moment's notice, and to be caught in your ignorance by people who will use it against you. You will mispronounce words in front of a crowd. It cannot be avoided. But your poems, with all of their deficiencies, products of lifelong observation and asymmetric knowledge, will be your own. Built on the edge of tradition, they will rarely be anthologized. I have camped at this outpost my whole life, as did my mother, who slept on sugar sacks in the basement or on the front porch in early spring, when snow still clumped around fugitive crocuses just to keep herself forsaken. I have time for just a shorty. I'll read a ballad from the sound hole of an unstrung guitar and then just a, a few lines of another. Ballad from the sound hole of an unstrung guitar. The best I ever wrote was in an attic. No chair, manual typewriter on an upended box. No screen on the lone window, which I removed. Ba bats flew through. I woke up one night and Blue was in bed with me. Nah, I said, and he put on his wire rim glasses and left. Somehow I ended up with two kittens, litter mates. I wonder how they lived and died, where they went. The only furniture was the mattress on the floor, a wooden box full of someone's Mardi Gras beads, no ethics, no lock on the door, no worries about vermin, rabies, fleas. Where did I pee in the middle of the night? There must have been a bathroom down those narrow stairs, a shower somewhere, a gold shower curtain laced with mold. Blue once told me I walked in on him peeing and I laughed that it ruined his life. Well, Jesus, I'm sorry. I would never have apologized back then. I knew no forms, just a swarm of bees in the rafters who agreed to leave me be. I made a line break when I took a drag on my Salem light. Menthols were pure as poetry. Where are the words now that you wrote in that hell hole? On the typewriter ribbon, I stuck in a knot hole. And finally, the last poem in the book, 
And this references Keats, who infamously wrote the great poem, Ode to the Nightingale. Romantic poet. You would not have loved him, my friend, the scholar decried. He brushed his teeth, if at all, with salt. He lied and rarely washed his hair, wiped his ass with leaves or with his hand. The top of his head would have barely reached your tits. His pits reeked, as did his deathbed. But the nightingale, I said. Thank you. Thank you, Di. That's so amazing. Thank you, Jane. We have lots to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Read to us. Okay. So I'm really thrilled to be here and incredibly honored, excited that this is the book launch day for Modern Poetry. Um, which is just a stunning, stunning book of poems. So we'll be talking about it more. Um, but I've been invited to read a, a few poems too. And um, Di and I have known each other for, I would say over 40 years. And um, my father knew Di, he was one of her poetry teachers and um, they had a long friendship in which they both supported each other as poets and influenced each other in important ways. Um, so I thought it would be appropriate for me to read a, a couple of poems about my father in this context. <clears throat> so the first one is called My Father's Messages Erased from My Answering Machine. Um, and it was written about a period right towards the end of my dad's life when he had been losing his memory. Um, so both sort of short-term and long-term memory started to go. And um, one thing that was interesting about it was that even though he, he lost his memory, he was still, his spirit was still really the same and he still had his curiosity and um, kind of warmth and interest in things. So some essential part of him was still there. Um, even as he forgot things. Um, the other piece of this that's useful to know is that I had a sister who died while we were traveling from Morocco to Spain. And so that comes up um, in this poem. My father's message is erased from my answering machine. Hi, it's just me. That might be the only phrase I know for sure was on the, mess the years of messages, the phone company, erased when they inexplicably changed my number. The messages are gone, but the grief is still there. Right, a fullness I'm glad I possess. We think we want grief to pass, but what would I do if it were gone, like the messages, irretrievable? There are videos of him reading poems, videos of him speaking, gesturing in the way he did, but nothing remains of his voice talking just to me. He might have said, you're probably out doing something fun. I hope so, but I can't be sure anymore, can I? Okay, hon, good night. Maybe we'll talk tomorrow. Would he have said it that way? So many other things got erased. He couldn't remember his grandsons. Who were those two guys who were here? I, to my shame, answered in a tone that said, you should know that. I never spoke to him that way otherwise. When we did crosswords, we searched for simple words, tree or snowflake. Do you know what it is, he'd ask, aware of his slowness. And I would mostly say no, but sometimes yes, to keep some truth in the room. The disconnection began long before he couldn't tie people to names or places to memories. He got disoriented away from home. And the last time I took him to visit my sister on the way back, still in an unfamiliar city, he asked, are we on Portage Road? Looking for something he could recognize. He might ask again a minute later. Then he said, now, do you have any children? And I too was lost, trying not to cry, driving on the dark street. He often marveled at the GPS 
Isn't that something? There's something up there that knows where you are and tells you where to go. He'd point up through the roof of the car. He said it almost every time we drove. He liked to marvel at things. The procedure the surgeon used to repair his retina or to zap the cancer. He'd talk with admiration as if it were not his own body under threat. Some piece of him stood apart ever since my sister died at nine, stepping off a train by accident while our family traveled through the foreign dark. A few months before the end, in the car on Portage Road, blocks from his house, he asked, what was that weird thing that happened in Morocco that killed your sister? Okay, I'm gonna read one more. And this, um, I actually wrote it at Di's suggestion. She suggested I try this form called the Rondeau, which is of course a French form and it's a pretty strict form. It just has two rhymes and then a repeating line. Um, but this is um, another poem sort of of grief for my father and it felt appropriate to write for him in a form. He was a formal poet by nature. He sort of was of the Richard Wilbur generation. So he grew up writing formal poems. And even though I, before this had never really written fo formal poetry, um, I decided to try my hand at it. So it's called Rondeau. My father's gone. He's in the steep place where bees have robust dreams of hyssop bloom and rafts of otter feast on crayfish, crab. Water supplies their need if such a need exists beyond. How did you sleep, I'd ask. He'd wave me off and seek a richer topic into potur. My father's gone. Honeybees link their legs asleep. Otters hold their paws to keep connected when adrift. A daughter wants her father, the one who taught her everything but how to grieve. My father's gone. Okay, that's good. And Di, I think we should we should get to talking now. Oh, what a beautiful set of poems, Jane. And it makes me think so much of Khan and and yeah. your relationship and and those those distances too mm -hmm. that came up um, over your sister and grief. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for those. Yeah, well, it's a total pleasure to be here with you, Ty. And I'm so just kind of overwhelmed by this book. I've been reading it and rereading it and writing things down and thinking about it. And um, it's a really, really powerful book. Um, so I thought that maybe I could just say a few things about things that I've noticed or that I experienced in reading the book. And maybe that would give us a starting point to talk. Please, um, yes. And I'm thinking also that maybe it's just helpful for people who are listening to get a little bit of a sort of framework for thinking about the book as a whole. And then we dive in and talk about whatever we want to talk about. Cool. Does that sound good? Yeah. So one thing that I want to say first is that, is that it's really – it's a volume of poems. It's not a collection of poems. It's um, so it's a it's meant to be read from start to finish. I mean, I'm someone who likes to dip into a book of poems, but with this book, I would really, really recommend starting at the beginning and reading it straight through um, because it's really built in a very specific way. And um, there's a an arc. I almost think of it as like a crescendo in the book that the book itself is a kind of crescendo. And it's really almost like a spiritual crescendo. And um, by reading it front to back, you get the full effect of that. You get to really experience that. Um, I feel like there are a couple of um, sort of threads that are pretty tangible in the book, and then some things that are maybe a little less tangible. Um, one of the threads which was really so, it's so present in that poem, You Read My Education, is this um, question of what it's like to be someone who is a poet and needs poetry, but maybe doesn't really have that kind of privileged access to poetry that 
some people have, you know, what it means to be, I think you said like um, camped on the outskirts of poetry. Um, and uh, so it seems like that's one of the things that the book looks at as just well as issues of class and um, what it's like to live in impoverished circumstances at times. Um, and the poem, I feel like the arc there is moving from this sort of outsider on the edge of tradition status to over the course of the book, I feel like you claim a place in, po in poetry. Modern poetry becomes your book. I mean, we now have a book called Modern Poetry with your name on it, you know? I mean, this is not the anthology that you read that was just Stevens and um, Rethke and write all the male poets. Like you have remade um, modern poetry. And I, there's this one, I just want to quote if I can, there's one moment that I love in this poem called Little Fugue with Gene Seberg and Tupperware. Um, <laughs> and it's talking about, I feel like this is super important to the book. It's talking about um, this like French movie star who, you know, you sort of felt like you had to pretend was wonderful or, you, you know, right? The, the kind of thing that we, felt like we used to have to do. Uh, but it says, did I ever love Jean-Paul Belmondo? Now he seems like some trifling prick I'd have to call into my office for disrespecting teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this moment that I love. It says, I'm teacher. That's it. And then these amazing lines. I had no God-given authority. I had to self-generate it like God. At some point, God had to take the leap to become God. So I feel like this is like one of the um, destinations of the book is like, and what you're watching happen in the book is like, I had no God-given authority. I had to generate it. You see that authority being generated through the poems in the mm -hmm. book. Um, so that's a pretty amazing thing. Um, and, and at another point you say, I've worked it all out in front of you and I feel that that's what we're watching. We're watching like modern poetry be recentered in the course of this um, book. And the other sort of related thread there is that I feel like the book really um, dismantles um, ideas about romance in relationship to women, somewhat in relationship to poetry also, but definitely in relation to the kind of ways that women are co-opted and diminished and trapped by certain ways of thinking about love and romance. And again, there's a line that stands out to me, which I just love, which is that you say, I think I can say it without even finding it, but it's like, um, never take an oath wearing clothes that have to be hung on padded hangers. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> like the whole wedding industry gets blown apart in this book. But again, the book moves towards something else. And later in the book, there's a section where about sort of um, making oaths that are a totally different kind of oath. And um, the speaker describes them as being indiscriminate. It's a kind of loving oath that embraces everything that's so different from that um, kind of constructed romance. Um, so those are just two of the threads and there's lots more that we can talk about, but does that give us a place to start? Oh my God, Jane, my jaw is shaking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you get, you understand this book probably better than I do, because mm -hmm. as you know, and I remember your dad saying, you know, I'd say, well, this poem of yours is about this and this and this and this kind. And he'd say, oh, well, yeah, maybe <laughs> I wasn't really thinking about it, yeah. <laughs> you know? but yeah. that's for you to figure out. <laughs> no, I mean, I, um, I'm, you know, it, writing this book re has required a period of recovery almost because mm -hmm. it was an intense dive and as you said it felt like a re a remaking of so many things of um 
you know, out of my real history, and not just mine, as you inferred in, in your introduction, but um, the history of my people, of, of mm -hmm. people like me, you know, whoever, whoever that is. Um, and then to sort of self-generate authority. Um, and, and, you know, when you read those lines about... Um, like God had to generate the authority to become God. Um, it reminded me of an early poem, Song in My Heart, where <laughs> <laughs> I, I write the same thing, you know, and compare, yeah. you know, like God um, with his broken down hush yeah. slippers. You right. Know? Uh -huh. um, so, you know, um, you start seeing, I guess, as you have a long writing life, the ways these tropes and concerns um, evolve through time. And mm -hmm. that's what, one thing I love about, about writing is that you're able to see, oh, you know, there was, a, and, and this is another subject, I think, in the book that I look back, even on Frank, um, Frank Sonnets, my last book, as as kind of innocent <laughs> in a way, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I feel like maybe part of what we all do, and artists and writers certainly, is slowly throw off those innocent notions, mm -hmm. and and this book was a big part of that. Mm -hmm. It feels like there's a huge dismantling of um, structures and, yeah, shedding, like shedding a lot of um, structures and things that don't serve. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, something else that I have been thinking about, and I'd be, I just am interested to hear what you think about this, is that, um, I mean, there's a lot in this book that's very personal and um, I feel like there's a kind of nakedness almost in the book. And I would think that it might be a scary book to release and to make public in some ways um, because it is very revealing. But um, at the same time, I feel like it's not even though it is very personal, it's not personal in the way like the confessional poets were personal because it's really ultimately about doing the work in the service of a whole lot of people. I, you know, I don't know if you feel it that way, but it's like in order for us to see these structures that we're all caught up in, you know, the, structures about class and about how women's lives are constructed and, you know, other things as well. But it's, you know, in order to see those, you, you like really inhabit them in the book and identify them and make them clear. Does that make sense? And then, it does. It does. <laughs> and literary hierarchies. Um, and literary hierarchies. Very, mm -hmm. very much so. Yeah. Um, and so it's like through your experience with those and your encounter with those and your owning of them and even in a certain way, um, it, it's, it, it's like liberating everybody. Um, so it feels like it's not ultimately like confessional, like I'm saying these things about myself so that you're going to think about me and my suffering or <laughs> my, you know, whatever. That's not it. That's not what the impulse in the book is. The impulse in the book is to get to someplace else. And that shit has to be clear, you know, called out and cleared away first. Yeah, two things that come to mind. Um, that poem that I read um, tonight, Pop Song, you know, that's really not a poem about my father. Or mm -hmm. although I, I was aware as I read it that it borrows some notions from one of Khan, your dad's poems, um, um, called Te Potslan, mm -hmm. which is about 
the daughter, the, the dead daughter, mm -hmm. the ghost, back. coming mm -hmm. back and looking in the windows mm -hmm. at her family uh -huh. and the heaviness of flesh, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the weight of it all. And mm -hmm. I did think about that as I was writing that poem. But, but um, it's much more introduces the notion that moves through the book of um, objectivity, the objectivity of the dead. Yes. <laughs> and the, and maybe another word for that is distance. Mm -hmm. um, and well, there's also, Di, I mean, there's also that moment in the um, poem about Keats coming back and looking in the window at Fanny Braun and um, I, I got to find the, um, the passage where it says um, that he doesn't see her as beautiful exactly. Uh -huh. um, his, his gaze was too objective to find her beautiful, but objectivity itself, that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. when I came to that moment in that poem, it was one of the last poems that I wrote for the book. Um, I felt a release of something that had been holding me through my whole life, mm -hmm. since probably since my father died, got sick and died. And that is that... Um, you know, being stuck in the personal, being stuck mm -hmm. in the narrative, mm -hmm. stuck in the story. And, um, you know, I'm interested in Buddhism mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> the, but I'm not a practitioner and, you know, I'm very, my, my, my daily life, I'm very, in a lot of ways, still stuck in the, in the body and all, but, um, to to really have come to that place in that poem where Keats, who who was so such a romantic, a romantic in every sense of the word, after death, sort of earns this objectivity, mm -hmm. and and he was so concerned with beauty, you know, truth is beauty, um, and the the truth, the the objective truth of seeing Fanny without illusion, without romantic, you know, claptrap, that itself is beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, not her. Mm -hmm. Not her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, the act of seeing. it's the act of seeing, right? Yes. That is the, the act of seeing, like, clearly without those kind of distortions. Without attachment, yeah. Without attachment, yeah. And that's the place that I feel like the book really arrives at is mm -hmm. some sort of ability to like look at everything with the same kind of interest and without, yeah, like in a, it, it feels very Buddhist at the end, mm -hmm. you know, like this place of kind of loving everything in a certain way. Mm -hmm. There's a poem called Love Letter in the book that, um, and, and I talk about a love letter my dad wrote my mom when they were real young and they were married and living up here, not far from where I live now in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He was in school and, you know, the love letter I have, my mom let me have it. And it's very um, real and has this deep red rose on the stationery. Mm. And he says, you know, I can't spell, <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, it's so charming, um, mm. that letter. And I sort of lift off from that letter, from the, from the weight, kind of the weightiness or the humanness of that letter into other ways for me now at my uh, age and given my experiences with what is called love, um, new ways to define love. Mm -hmm. And as you say, I think in that poem and others, I come to 
a love of the world, um, a love letter to the world, but not in an ooey gooey way. Definitely not ooey gooey. Not in an ooey gooey way. Well, you know, the objectivity is almost a little bit cold, right? And it is. The thing about objectivity that's. It, and I've been exploring coldness mm -hmm. for a while since Four Legged Girl. Um, my own capacity for coldness, not as a critique mm -hmm. of myself, but as an observation, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that that coldness can release us from from sort of destructive attachments of which mm -hmm. I have had many. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, you know, it's sort of a two pronged book in that what I what is what I know that allowed me the right to write the poems is very much a narrative of my own experience. Mm -hmm. But what I'm reaching for is something more universal or mm -hmm large, you know, larger than that. And in fact, some of the poems almost read, and I, I'm asking my readers to um, bear with me in them, almost have an essay quality, especially there's a poem called Poetry and one called Against Poetry and Love Letter that really sort of make an argument and uh, make a case for a certain kind of, uh, thinking about things that for me is a shedding and mm -hmm. of an old way of being. And um, yeah, so that required kind of a rhetorical approach that is new mm -hmm. for me. I found it very challenging. Yeah. And it kind of is in opposition to what I say in my education, which is, you know, sort of, I do what I do. What do I know? I, you know, I take what I need and move forward. And, you know, this book, by the, by the mid and, and into the ending, it, it works differently from that. Mm -hmm. you know, as you say, I claim a certain kind of authority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you said when you were reading one of your poems, you said you referred to the thesis of the book. Mm hmm what do you think of as, and, and you know, when you said they're kind of essay like, what do you think of it as being the thesis of the book? Oh, God, Jane. You said it. I know. And now <laughs> I have to live with it. <laughs> um, well, I think there are a few, but um, the question I brought to the book, and it was a pretty desperate question, was can poetry matter? Mm -hmm. And I felt that deeply spiritually, personally, I had come to doubt that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was, is political politics, mm -hmm. um, global politics, and American politics. Mm -hmm. And the insanity of the pandemic, mm -hmm. and the the crazy divisions and divisiveness um, between people in this country. And I still feel a lot of despair. Mm -hmm. um, so what does a writer do who has come to that degree of despair, mm -hmm. even about the efficacy of language? Mm -hmm. And the only thing I knew to do was to face it in the poems. Mm -hmm. And so I think the thesis is, yes. <laughs> I think I come to that poems mat can matter and do matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also, I, I think reconstruct what poems are and can be and how they can or or they can um, reveal a clear truth, or they can obfuscate truth, so they can be used against mm -hmm. people too. You know, so that's a biggie. And and then I think 
um, the 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 purity of the concrete objective imagination mm -hmm. and how maybe you know language is it's it's a material you know it feels material it feels like chunks of stuff that can weigh us down um and so it's an ironic craft to use those heavy things those heavy words to create air to create spaciousness mm -hmm. and to create attachment mm -hmm. um so that conundrum i think is part of what i'm working with in the book mm -hmm. I think there are many, you know, there are many ways that you could talk about the central thesis of this book, mm -hmm. but maybe you have given me the best one, and that is self-generating authority mm -hmm. in your life and in your whatever you practice, whatever work you do, whatever. Mm -hmm just the way, whether you work at, or at all, just the way you walk down the street or, or look in the mirror, you know, the self-generation of, of authority. I think that has to be it. And you found it. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God you showed. So, um, we just have a few minutes left. I want to ask you other stuff. Maybe we should have an opportunity for people to ask questions. Can Let's do that. Help us with that. Hi, Shane. I'm back. You're back. <laughs> um, I want to, on behalf of the audience who are so passionate and so thankful for this evening, um, some people are showing how much they really uh, appreciate this evening, the readings, um, there are so many comments and it, it is so heartening. Um, but I wanted to say that this is a book of poetry that I wish college age Shane could have read. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to 60 year old Shane being able to read. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, I'm really, I appreciate this evening a lot personally. Thank uh, you, Shane. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have already been posted, but if you do have a question, we will take a couple of questions from the audience. This first one is going to come from Donna. Uh, Donna asks uh, about the musical forms used in the book. Did you self-study these forms in music, i.e. the repeating motifs of a fugue to inform your diction choices and movement for those poems? Yes. <laughs> I, Donna, you're smart. I did. Um, I, I don't know much about um, musical forms. And so, like I say in the poem, my education, I had to teach myself. So I did research and listened a lot. I was really interested in the fugue and slash the fugue state, the connection between the musical fugue and the fugue state, um, because I walk into the book. The first poem is called Little Fugue State, and that um, the fugue state is um, a, a result of trauma often uh, in which somebody um, loses memory, has amnesia, doesn't know where they are. And that's, that's the state of being I wanted to enter the book with. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fugue then sent me in other directions toward the ballad, Rhapsody, the Rhapsody, which is a, a musical form, I didn't know, the aria, you know, the sort of long held note, the big strip tease. And so, um, yes, and so then I could, um, I'm not, I don't, I don't think I'm naturally a music driven poet. And so I wanted to see how much in this book I could infiltrate. It, I could infiltrate the poems with music and um, 
music, the lyric, um, as a counterbalance to the cynicism, the darkness that we're all experiencing. Mm -hmm. Music sort of the hint in the book of using musical forms throughout is that music will out. Music answers the question that I am carrying through the book. You know, mm -hmm. um, music wins. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, why I made that choice. And then it helped me infiltrate these poems with, um, you know, ver various kinds of musical um, lineation and, and sound and, you know, without being too regularized. I, you know, I didn't do that, but it helped. Mm -hmm. Uh, Christy is asking about your interview in uh, Poets and Writers with Bianca Stone. And the quote is, the narrative of memory is crucial, but something needs to transform that narrative and urge oneself into the hard questions. And Christy is asking if you can talk about those questions. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> um, Jane... <laughs> it's a hard question. So, yeah, I mean, I think I was saying in that interview, I haven't seen it yet, to be honest, but I think I was saying that, you know, the story of your life isn't enough. I think in the beginning it can be enough. I, I think all writers need to go through a period of claiming and telling their story in one way or another. But you can't do that you know, you start running on fumes on that. Mm -hmm. And so then you have to start seeing sort of what is my fairy tale, my folk tale, my allegory? What what arrows is it directing me toward that are larger than my own narrative? Mm -hmm. um, and you've heard us talk about what some of those are. And, you know, I remember Jane's dad saying, um, some student asked him, you know, what do you do if you just don't have anything to write about? You know, you've written about all the shit and then what? And he said, oh, just wait, life will give it to you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and it's true, you know, it's true. Mm -hmm. So when you've lived enough shit, you have that material, but it, the telling of it ceases to be enough. You mm -hmm. want to use it towards something larger, a philosophy, a theology, um, an aesthetic, something, you know, that, you know, I think I asked in the last poem in Frank Sonnet, um, I asked if I can have a legacy, you know, um, like other writers or mm -hmm. artists. Frank O'Hara, I mentioned in the last poem. And the legacy I talk about in that last poem is through kisses. I kissed Whitman, somebody who kissed Whitman's lips, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but in this book, I think I'm asking for a legacy that isn't just about kisses and isn't just mine. Mm -hmm. It's a legacy for us, um, mm -hmm. for writers who who have set up camp on the margins for whatever reason mm -hmm. um, to find, to recenter what poetry mm -hmm. is and can be. And, and I hope that is a kind of legacy. Mm -hmm. Is that a place to end? It's nine sharp, my time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, this was really quite a memorable evening. We do have signed copies, signed book plates available at left-bank.com. I will share again the link in the comments. Uh, we do have Jane's beautiful books available to order as well, so you can get them all packed up nice together in one fancy little box. Uh, we will send them anywhere in the country. And I really thank you for supporting an independent bookstore. And from wherever you are, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a great rest of your evening.
Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Jane. And that rhymes. And <laughs> thank you, audience. Thank, thank you, daughter. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Love to all. Yeah. Good night.